Greetings to our respected colleagues. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my research work at the Virtual International Conference on Marine Science and Aquaculture 2022. The title of my presentation is Genetic Diversity of Tor Dorensis Populations in Sabah Implications for Aquaculture and Conservation. is a cyprinid reverse fish species. It is related to carps and it is commonly known as Pelian in Sabah, Sama in Sarawak and Kala in Peninsula Malaysia. Tor is an important game fish as well as an ornamental fish. It's a source of food to native villagers and it has aquaculture potential. It is also a high value aquaculture resource the primary threat to tor comes from the anthropogenic impacts which lead to degradation and overfishing in its natural habitats. Within Sabah, a community conservation program known as Tagal has been designed to conserve populations in situ. The Sabah state government has also identified tor as a keystone species for the 12th Malaysia plan. Now within village riparian ecosystems, the Tagal system of conservation is utilized to culture the tor species. This is an in-situ conservation facility which has been allocated and the harvesting is only done at specified periods every year. And in this way, the populations are restocked naturally. Now within Sabah, there's a clear demarcation of the topography in terms of the riverine ecosystems. And this topography is divided based on the Trusmadi and the Crocker ranges. If we look at the overall population, we can view and identify four distinct populations based on the riparian river basins. These are the West Coast, Interior, Sandakan and Kudat populations. One of the key aspects of this kind of study is to identify population diversity. And once we have that information on population diversity, we can make data-driven decisions regarding the genetic structure, the evolutionarily significant units, as well as the management units, and decide upon the strategy for breeding, as well as the application to aquaculture management. Now, one of the primary research questions which we have to address is the matter of speciation and do the molecular markers have evidence of a speciation event which may be caused because of geographic distribution and the lack of corridors between riverine ecosystems. The methodology we employed was based on two types of loci. The first was the mitochondrial DNA D-loop hypervariable region, which was used to identify haplotypes based on matrilineage. And the second was the microsatellite diversity, which was based on seven loci, which has been published earlier. The data derived from this analysis was subjected to descriptive statistics as well as exploratory based clustering and model based clustering. All of this was done in order to obtain a graphical representation of the diversity levels, which could be applied for making management decisions. A total of 175 individuals were sampled across the entire riverine system. And what was observed at the first instance was genetic clustering based on geographic isolation, as well as the substructuring of populations within each of these clusters. To look at the 
scale. In terms of the mitochondrial D-lobe di diversity, what was observed was a high level of haplotype diversity. Now, haplotype diversity is an indication of fixation of that particular haplotype in a geographic location. It may also be an indication of a bottleneck event. But because mitochondrial DNA evolves at a significantly higher rate as compared to nuclear DNA, there can be implications for conservation in terms of cryptic speciation. So a high number of haplotypes may be indicative of cryptic speciation, even though the phenotype is the same. In terms of microsatellite diversity, there was a high degree of allelic richness and private alleles were also observed. The expected heterozygosity was relatively low, but the richness was very high, which means the evolutionary forces are driving the fixation and the evolution of new alleles within the subpopulations. When these two elements were compared, what we observed is that each of the riparian uh, systems had their own levels of diversity, allelic richness, both in terms of nucleotide diversity, as well as the heterozygosity and the haplotype diversity. So this is an overview of the different riverine systems. And you can see in certain riverine systems, there's a low level of allelic richness and a low level of heterozygosity. Now, all of this points to distinct populations because each of them has their own specific characteristics. And when we look at the, hiplo, the haplotypes, what we see is a clear distribution of the clads based on the riparian ecosystems, as well as the eastern, central, northwestern, and southwestern clads. All of this is indicative of populations which are evolving in isolation. A graphical representation of the uh, Bayesian analysis of population structure with the D-loop from mitochondria indicated the presence of eight distinct populations based on haplotypes. On the other hand, the microsatellite analysis revealed five different haplotypes. Now, this has to be taken in context with the evolutionary rates of these two types of loci. Mitochondrial loci evolve at a higher rate as compared to microsatellite loci. And microsatellite loci are inherited biparently. So this gives an idea of the levels of diversity in terms of the population and the inheritance of alleles from both the parents. In terms of the pairwise distance, which indicates uh, the genetic differentiation, genetic differentiation was observed between some populations with a distinct variation. However, a majority of the populations again indicated that the populations were not breeding or inbreeding. Now, what does all of this data imply in terms of managing the resources? We are looking at it in terms of two different aspects. The first is the aquaculture aspect, which involves selective breeding for desirable traits. And the second aspect is the conservation aspect, which involves the conservation of germplasm in situ in its native state. So there are two evolutionarily significant units, which are the Western and Eastern one. And there are management units, which are based on the major drainages. In this case, drainages refer to the riparian ecosystems. How do we translate this into conservation strategies? 
The first one is the in-situ conservation, which is currently being undertaken by the Tagal ecosystem at the village level. So this is an in-situ conservation in which there is no interchange of germplasm. However, the disadvantage of in-situ conservation is over a period of time, there will be inbreeding depression due to inbreeding within that population. The next thing which can be done is admixtures. Now, admixtures are not generally recommended because of deleterious alleles, which are known as maladaptive alleles. Too much admixture may, really, uh, may result in a population which is not fit, uh, even though it is outbred. The third strategy which we can adopt is to establish populations by selective breeding and restocking. So these selectively bred populations can be used to restock as well as applied to aquaculture. Now in terms of the breeding programs, the objective is to develop elite lines with desired characteristics. This may be related to the FCR, the feed conversion ratios, as well as resistance to disease and growth. In this case, we can explore different approaches. The first can be the experimental test cross between specimens derived from each of the populations, the selection of phenotypes based on fitness, and then the mapping of the traits to quantitative loci. In some cases, gene pyramiding can be done. However, all of this has to take into account the breeding cycle and it may require three to four years to come up with an elite line after much trial and error. We have the following recommendations based on the data which we have garnered over the duration of the study. The first is to always employ a data-driven approach when it comes to conservation. The second is to continue the in-situ conservation using the Tagal approach, as well as having a broodstock management facility, which has in-situ inbred populations at a specific location. We also need to look at the cryptic diversity and re-examine the population using higher resolution molecular markers. Experimental crossbreeding is another area which can be adopted in order to develop populations which are ideal for commercial exploitation. And finally, the identification of QTLs and linkage mapping will facilitate the long-term conservation of the species as well as its commercial implications. I would like to acknowledge the Department of Fisheries Sabah and the UMS Great Grant which has funded the study. And I would also like to thank the riparian village communities in Sabah who have been actively conserving this species and contributing to the long-term conservation of Tor. This is our reference. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.